the topic of this clip is Hirschsprung's disease. Hirschsprung disease is a disorder that affects approximately 1 in 100,000 live births. The clinical presentation of Hirschsprung disease is often quite characteristic. It usually affects the neonates very early on, and the most common presentation is lack of passage of stool within the first 24 hours. That's the common presentation. And this is probably the reason why, culturally, parents are usually very anxious until the baby has their first meconium in the diaper, and literally that's often a cause of celebration, because it means that the gastrointestinal tract is working okay. There is a more atypical presentation, which is an often later presentation that's more vague, with distension, poor feeding, there could be some vomiting, features of pain, but the most common presentation, and the one likely to be asked on exams, is lack of passage of meconium within the first 24 to 48 hours. That is the clinical presentation of Hirschsprung's disease. Now, there are several clinical types of Hirschsprung's disease. The most common type is short segment disease. For the purposes of this discussion, we'll ignore the ultra-short segment disease because that really isn't part of the major Hirschsprung's disease. It's sort of a special topic. So we'll talk... Short segment disease, however, is the most common type. In short segment disease, a certain length, a variable length of colon is involved, beginning at the rectum and proceeding proximally for a variable length, but... Anything beyond, anything more proximal than the splenic flexure is okay, is not involved. So the disease has to stop at the splenic flexure or it's not called short segment disease. So short segment disease is really a sigmoid rectum disease. And sigmoid rectum and anus. And then there are longer segment diseases. And these diseases are clinically important dis to distinguish because the short segment disease usually has a classical presentation me mechanistically, it's often associated with mutations in the RET gene. Um, in the short segment disease, males are predominant, so we know that the penetrance of the gene is not very high, and something about the male phenotype brings out the expression of the disease, whereas in females, maybe perhaps it's more quiescent. There's a 4 to 1 male predominance. It's a classical presentation. The disease is left-sided colon involvement. And it's the ma majority of cases of Hirschsprung's disease, a relatively, cons like, like a significant majority. There is a second type that's longer segment disease, so it could even be transcolonic and it could even be beyond. It could even involve the small intestine. These tend to be more familial. They tend to be more hereditary. So a child has it, and the sibling has it, and the sibling has it. So the more sibling involved, the more hereditary, the less the male predominance, and also the more likely there could be other syndromic associations. I won't get into the syndromic associations very much, but I'm going to now take a little break and discuss the etiology of the disease, and when I discuss that, I'll give you a sense of why there could be syndromic associations. With regard to etiology, if we imagine the early forming embryo where this is the ectoderm and the yellow here represents endoderm and we take a cross section, remember that there's an invagination off the ectoderm that forms the neural tube that becomes the brain and spinal cord and nervous system. Well, early on in embryology, something breaks off, a bunch of cells break off the neural tube and they form a migrating part of the neural system that's called the neural crest. And these migrating cells go all over the body and we won't discuss it, they form melanocytes, they form peripheral nerves, but what I want you to pay attention to today is that they form the enteric nervous system. They break off and some of them migrate along through the mesentery into the gut and they form the ENS or enteric nervous system. The gut has its own autonomous nervous system that actually has more neurons, well we call them ganglion cells in the gut, but they're really just neurons, more neurons, believe it or not, than the spinal cord resolve in the gut. Because the gut has its own, open quotes, brain, close quotes, that's why your gut could do its own calculations. That's why it could do complex calculations to propel things, 
from the beginning of the gut to the end of the gut, and you're not even aware. The gut is autonomously doing these calculations because you have an autonomous enteric nervous system. So what's Hirschsprung's disease? It's a deficit in migration. In other words, Hirschsprung's disease starts very early. It occurs in the embryonic phase, before 10 weeks gestation. It probably somewhere two weeks, sorry, before 10 weeks gestational age, or eight weeks, or eight weeks, um, before... 10 weeks gestational age is 8 weeks of development. Even 2 weeks of development um, is Hirschsprung's could already be set down. So I just want you to understand that Hirschsprung is established very, very early in the embryonic stage. The other take-home message here is that it's associated with a deficit in neural crest migration. Because the neural crest forms various lineages, some Hirschsprung's could have other neural crest associations. And so problems with the melanocytes, problems with your sympathetic nervous system, and thus problems with your breathing rhythms. I won't go into the various associations that there are, but, you know, even stuff like your melanocytes cause pigmentation, so problem with the pigmentation of your hair. The family of diseases that relate to generic problems of your neural crest was named by a brilliant Canadian pathologist called Bob Belandi. And that family of disease is called neurochristopathy. Neurochristopathy, in other words, pathy, diseases of the neural crest. Neurochristopathy. So when I talk about syndromic Hirschsprungs, they're often neurochristopathies. Clinically, then, going back to clinical, your diagnostic test for Hirschsprung disease, if a child doesn't pass meconium in the first 48 hours, and you want to know what's going on, one does a barium enema. What you see on the barium enema, so barium is instilled through the rectum, and the barium goes in, and it looks quite narrow. You see a narrow area, and it suddenly opens up. And we actually call this bird beaking, because it sort of looks like a bird's beak, if you imagine this sideways. But, that's interesting. What this tells you is that the disease segment, which is here, is actually narrow. It's constricted. So, I want you to understand something relatively interesting. The absence of an enteric nervous system, the net effect, is increased muscular tone, not decreased. So, the, the muscle has its own tone. And in the absence of nerves, t and in the absence of neurons telling them what to do, the muscle is actually more tense, not less tense. So the disease segment is constricted, and then you get a pre-constriction dilatation. This is actually probably normally innervated, but it's a pre-constriction dilatation that gives you the bird beak appearance. So that's what you see on the barium enema. You see bird beak appearance with, a, with, with proximal dilatation, constriction of the diseased area. But now you want to establish a diagnosis because the treatment is very serious. It's surgery. So you really want to do a good diagnosis. So the diagnostic procedure is called an endorectal suction biopsy. What the surgeon does is he puts in a biopsy forceps through the anus into the rectum and takes a sampling and sends it to the pathology lab to try to make a diagnosis. So now... To understand how this biopsy business works, let's quickly review the anatomy of the gut. You have your mucosa, which, are, which is your epithelium, and your lamina propria, which is between the glands, and underneath that, shown in purple here, is your muscularis mucosa. Under that, you have your first plexus of your neurons, of your enteric nervous system, because your enteric nervous system exists as two plexuses. Plexus just means groups of things. Your first is your submucosal plexus. We'll call it your SM plexus, your group of neurons underneath the mucosa. Then you have, underneath that, you have your first layer, your inner circular and outer longitudinal layer of muscle, shown here in brown, which constitutes your muscularis propria. And between your two muscular layers, you have your plexus of nerves, uh, plexus of nerve cells, neurons between your muscles. And surprisingly, we call that the myenteric, which means between the muscles, or intramuscular plexus. People also use words like our backs plexus, but I, I encourage you not to use the eponyms. Use the anatomical site. There's a submucosal plexus here and a myenteric plexus here. The myenteric plexus is really what governs contraction. Your submucosal plexus governs neurosecretory reflexes. Because of that, which is your important plexus? Your myenteric plexus, of course. So that plexus is rich in neurons, dense in neurons. They're all over the place. They're easy to see. Your submucosal plexus is rather more sparse. But remember what I said. 
Now let's go back to your biopsy. The surgeon goes in, in the ent luminally from here, and the sampling goes from the inside out, and it's a gentle sampling, so you're only sampling what I've shown here, what I've highlighted in red. So you're only sampling, because you don't want to make a hole in the patient's gut, you only sample the mucosa, and what you're going for is this submucosal plexus. The problem is that the pathologist now, so imagine you put your biopsy gun in, and you took your piece of tissue, and you did it three times, and you send it to the pathologist, and you get these very small hockey pucks of tissue that are at most one to two centimeters in diameter and 0 0.5 centimeters deep. Well, these little hockey pucks of tissue, at their very depths, is your submucosal plexus. They may or may not have sampled a neuron. To make matters worse, a pathologist can't look at the entire little tiny hockey puck because you need to cut the sections very thin to see them under the microscope. In fact, five micrometers, five one thousandths of a millimeter thin. So you're looking at very, very small sections of tissue. So the problem is just like, I'll give you an example of the problem. You're asking me, the pathologist, you're asking the pathologist, do you see ganglion cells? And you're telling me that you're going to make the diagnosis based on an absence. That the absence of something makes a diagnosis. And the consequences are big. If I tell you that they're not there, you're going to do surgery. But what if we're just not seeing them and they're really there? It's like if you give me a slice of bread, and you ask me, did this slice of bread come from a raisin bun? And my answer is, how many raisins in a raisin bun? How thick is the slice? And how dispersed is there are the raisins? And then I could tell you, based on probability, if I look at enough levels, if I look at enough levels, I could tell you, no, it doesn't come from a raisin bun. So people did the math, and it turns out that the pathologist has to look at 75 layers. So if at 75 5 micron sections there are no neurons, then that's positive for Hirschsprung's disease. But nature helps us sometimes. Because in addition to the intrinsic enteric nervous system that I told you about, there, the, the gut is also innervated by big wires, big nerves from the outside that's called the extrinsic nervous system. And it turns out that these extrinsic nerves are very opportunistic. And when your intrinsic nervous system is missing, let's just delete some of them, what happens is your intrinsic nerves get bigger. You get these big hypertrophic nerves. So that could be diagnostically useful. But it's not, it's helpful, but it's not what makes the diagnosis. The ultimate thing you need is aganglionosis, the absence of ganglion cells. So you want your pathologist to prove a negative. And proving a negative requires looking at many levels. If the pathologist is confident that the biopsy is adequate, in other words, that it samples enough of the submucosa, because if it only samples mucosa, then it can't see ganglion cells. If the biopsy is adequate, showing enough submucosa and has a ganglionosis, then you could make your diagnosis. The last quick comment I would make, sometimes the pathologist uses what's called special stains. And the reason is, is that these nerves send off, these neurons send off branches, axons and dendrites, here, 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 many, many, many. So sometimes, in addition to looking for the neurons, you could look for the more widely dispersed axons and dendrites because that increases your statistical probabilities. The problem is they're hard to see, but we could overcome that with immunoperoxidase. And the immunoperoxidase that's currently in vogue is called calretinin, so you may hear about calretinin. But the main thing that you want your pathologist to prove is aganglionosis, and of course nerve hypertrophy, outside hypertrophic nerves, can help. Once a diagnosis of Hirschsprung's disease is made, you could confirm the diagnosis of Hirschsprung's disease. What, once a diagnosis is made and confirmed, you want to treat the patient. And the current standard of care involves, surprise, surprise, removing the disease segment, but trying to preserve the sphincter mechanism. Because it goes all the way down to the anal sphincter, and you don't want to cut out the anal sphincter. So you want to cut out the disease segment, bring this part down, but somehow preserve the sphincter. And I'll leave that discussion for the surgical techniques clips. But just to tell you that the pathologist has a role here, too. Because at the surgeon sees that, okay, this looks strictured, this part looks dilated, it's probably better.
But we know that the gross appearance that you're looking at with the naked eye doesn't 100% confirm that there are definitely neurons there yet. You really want, before cutting and, and stapling, before doing your anastomosis, you want to really be sure that ganglion cells are there. So what you do is you take a biopsy and you send that to pathology, but that's a slightly different biopsy, as I'm going to show you. So the biopsy that the surgeon does intraoperatively when he or she is performing the anastomosis, now the patient's belly is open and you're trying to figure out where to cut. At that point, you do the biopsy from the outside in. You do the biopsy from here, from the outside in. That's called a seromuscular biopsy. I'm showing it now with my white pen. The advantage of that are many. Number one, the number of neurons in your myenteric plexus, in your intramuscular plexus, are much greater, so it's easier to sample. Number two, you're not trying to prove a negative, you're trying to prove a positive. So you don't need to look at that many levels. The pathologist is happy. But the pathologist has to do it fast, has to do it in real time while you're operating. So the pathologist employs a technique called frozen section to get you a real-time answer. So you, what you do is you take a biopsy from the outside in. That's called a seromuscular biopsy. The pathologist tells you, yes, there are ganglion cells present. That's where you cut. You bring it down and you anastomose. And that is a surgical correction of Hirschsprung's disease. The last thing I'll close with, so the treatment involves res removing the disease segment but preserving the sphincter mechanism. There's various procedures called the Sove procedure, the Duhamel procedure. I'll leave it out, but they're meant to remove the disease but yet preserve the sphincter. The importance of the pathologist is to establish the diagnosis on the suction biopsy and then intraoperatively to show you that you have a ganglionic segment. The last thing I'll mention very briefly is that 70% of the patients do well after surgery, 30% experience residual con con constipation or other complications. So that tells us that even the areas that look at and that have ganglion cells may not be fully biologically normal. And that takes you out of the scope of defined knowledge and into the realm of research. But 70% do very well once you reanastomose ganglionic segment and remove the aganglionic segment. Thank you so much for listening.